So the best way to illustrate this point, let's have an informed discussion about coronary artery disease. And the reason I picked coronary artery disease is we're still at a place where over 40% of people in the United States die of heart disease, something related to heart disease. So it's the number one killer in our country and in many westernized countries as well. So since it affects so many people, let's see what that looks like. Now, the first thing we'll do is we'll review traditional options for treating coronary artery disease. One of them is a marker for coronary artery disease is statin drugs, Lipitor, Crestor, you've seen the ads. Um, if you look at the efficacy rate for these drugs, Crestor reduces the risk of having a major event by 1.2%. That shocks most people. Lipitor is the best of the bunch at 1.6%, and if you average out all of them, it's really 7 tenths of a, of a percent drop in the risk of having a major coronary event. Statins don't reduce mortality when used for primary prevention, and less than 50% of pa patients continue to take them because they have side effects. Now, I've been asked for years how I get people to want to change their diet and lifestyle habits. Well, when you start putting this kind of information in front of people, it disturbs them. Because unfortunately, one of the bad things that happens in medicine is we lull people into a false sense of security, thinking that the drugs that they're taking, the procedures they're agreeing to, are actually providing them with better health when actually that's not the case in many instances. Now, um, let's look at just a couple of side effects of statin drugs. Now, just to be clear here, I'm summarizing a lot of things. I have a three-hour lecture just on statin drugs. But if we got to do the whole extended version of everything I'm going to say here today, I would be long past my time, and I am watching this. That, that, it's a very interesting thing here. They tell you exactly when you have to finish, this little clock here. All right, so let's look at one thing. People, statin drugs do cause cognitive decline. In fact, the FDA moved cognitive decline to the top of the list um, a few years ago. And in a double-blind, placebo-controlled study involving a number of adults taking statin drugs, the conclusion was 100% of statin drug users will experience some cognitive decline. Okay, that's a pretty serious side effect. Musculoskeletal injuries, and I'm not going to read you all the stats on these slides, I'll just tell you the summary here. Um, one person is harmed for every 37 to 58 people who take the drugs, and, and one of the number one reasons why people stop taking them is almost instantaneous onset of musculoskeletal pain after they start taking the drugs. Some other risks, increased risk of moderate or severe uh, liver dysfunction, acute renal failure, uh, myopathy, cataracts, uh, esophageal cancer. For women, the number of pe women needed to treat to prevent one, one case of cardiovascular disease over five years, 37. For men, it's 33. Lots of people have to take these drugs with all those side effects just to prevent one episode of cardiovascular disease. Now, this is very interesting. The average person who takes statin drugs increases their fat intake by by significant amount and their calorie intake. And, um, and the people taking statin drugs have bigger increases in their BMI. And a lot is being written about this in medical journals today, which is that the false sense of security that comes along with taking drugs that have such limited efficacy, one of the major side effects is thinking everything's taken care of. I can eat steak, I can eat french fries, I can have fried chicken, because my cholesterol is low because I'm taking a statin drug. So perhaps the worst side effect of these drugs is the false sense of security associated with taking them. It causes people to misbehave even more than they would have otherwise. Now here's another drug that's commonly prescribed to people who have markers for cardiovascular disease or are at risk, or increasingly, not at any risk at all. Have you ever noticed that lately you reach a certain age and you're supposed to start taking certain drugs because you've reached that age? Aspirin's one of them. And there are great big campaigns on television telling people to ask their doctor about starting an aspirin regimen because you're 50 or because your brother had a heart attack or something of that nature. Um, actually, aspirin is pretty useless, particularly for primary prevention. And if you look at the, the data, for every event you, you stop, you have an equal number of events that involve bleeding out. Okay, so again, I think most people buying an over-the-counter, inexpensive aspirin think that they're protecting themselves a whole lot more than they are, and the fact that it's over-the-counter makes people think it's less risky than prescription drugs. That's one of the problems with over-the-counter drugs, is just the perception that they must inherently be safe. 
Um, treating hypertension. A lot of people who die of cardiovascular disease start with markers like hypertension. Um, there's such a thing as a J-curve, which tells you what basically what this means, and, and putting it in simple terms, is that sometimes the more treatment you deliver to somebody, the worse you make them. So the more drugs you give them, the, low, the more you lower their blood pressure, the worse they actually get. And then this is a, a paragraph that, was, that actually came out of the minutes of the European Hypertension Society's meeting in 2014, where a doctor got up there and then said, we, we have this other problem, and that is that we don't even know what ideal blood pressure is and the target for treating. Now, doesn't that fill you with reassurance that a bunch of expert cardiologists meeting in Europe to discuss how to treat patients are basically saying, we don't have a clue, all right? Um, now, reducing blood pressure to below 140 over 90 is associated with more heart attacks, strokes, and deaths. And the Cochrane Collaboration, the most independent medical research organization on the planet, says that when you lower blood pressure below 140 over 90, you really don't reduce deaths, you may increase the death rate. People over the age of 60, these are studies here showing people over the age, uh, age of 60 shouldn't be medicated until their uh, blood pressure reaches 150 over 90. Other studies show 160 over 100. The point here is not that we should leave people with high blood pressure alone. The point is that we're over medicating people. And these people would be excellent candidates to change their diet and lifestyle habits in order to reduce their risk of having a heart attack. Now this little chart is hard to see. But what it basically shows is this, and this is something to remember both for yourself, your family members, and other people you care about. The smaller the abnormality, the less likely you are to benefit from treating it with drugs, okay? So if you have ridiculously high blood pressure, I still think it's a better idea to lose weight and eat better. But you may benefit for a while from taking an antihypertensive drug. But if your blood pressure is just a little bit high, more harm than good most of the time. And so um, one of the numbers we use to, to um, evaluate this all the time is called the number needed to treat. And so what you'll see is that the number, of, uh, if you look at the risk reduction, if, you're, if your diastolic blood pressure is really, really high, you're gonna get an 80% reduction in risk. That's significant. If it's not very high at all, you're gonna get a 9% reduction in risk. And so when you get down to those smaller numbers, because your abnormalities are smaller, you have to sometimes treat hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people for one person to benefit. And you know what happens to the hundreds of people who aren't that one person? No benefit, all side effects. Those are people who should be taught to change their diet and lifestyle habits. Um, in this particular study, looked at 26,875 people over the age of 45 who had hypertension. And, um, and they looked at people who had normal blood pressure, prehypertension, stage one, stage two, four classes of medication used. And, and the bottom line is four classes of medication, meaning how, how many drugs you took. 46% of the people who were successfully treated, I put air quotes around that, successfully treated, had strokes. Now, in what universe do we consider 40% of successful treatment involves stroke? In the medical universe, that's where we think that. Even worse, the stroke, reduce, or, uh, the stroke risk increased for each additional drug added. So the more they treated these people, the more heart attacks and strokes they had. All right? Now, how many people think that if a lot of folks saw this kind of information, they'd say, sign me up for diet change? Okay, we're not finished yet, right? There's more. This is the most recent trial, and, this show, and I'm, I'm not here to bash medicine, but I am here to talk to you about how misled people are by what the newspapers report, by the perceptions in medicine, by people who are in authority and have a great deal of prestige associated with their name. This sprint trial, let me tell you what happened here. This, this trial was designed to see what would happen if you started medicating the heck out of people really ratcheting down their blood pressure to what are considered ideal levels by adding drug after drug after drug after drug until you reach that target number. And um, I think it was 2014 or 15, at the end of last year, they stopped the trial early because the benefits of medicating people this way were so spectacular that it was considered unethical to withhold the additional drugs from the control group, okay? Now, at the time, they, they released no data at that time, and if you go back and check my archives, I actually wrote an article at that time saying, wait until the information comes out, because when we really get a chance to look at the data, we're gonna find out that it's not quite as beautiful as they say that it is. Nonetheless, this doctor 
writes that this is the most important blood pressure trial in the history of cardiology. It's going to be a game changer. Okay, now here's what it basically said. The incidence of events dropped from 6.8% to 5.2% over a 3.2 uh, year period of time. We're talking about a reduction of 1.6%. Okay, 1.6% reduction. Now, look at this. For every 1,000 people treated during that period of time, um, 16 people would benefit. We'd hurt 22. Okay, in what universe does benefiting 16 and hurting 22 to get there considered a good outcome? And then they said, well, for the rest of them, it was just a wash. Okay, well, some of these people were taking four drugs. How can they say that the rest of these people were not harmed in some way? Maybe not during that 3.2 year period of time, but certainly taking four blood pressure drugs sooner or later, if you look at the side effects from these drugs, would catch up with you. This is considered big advances in cardiology. This is the best it gets.